everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ryan and Rodrigo. Uh, this week, we are lucky to be joined by one of my best friends, Tom Martinell. Today, Tom lives in Sao Paulo, and he is a freelance translator. And if anyone needs documents or presentations or books translated from Portuguese into English, um, just look for his information in the description. He really, really loves language. And I think that's partly because he has called so many places home. I met him in Seattle. He grew up in rural Montana, and he spent time in Mexico and Korea before coming to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And Tom, um, I know that outside of the United States, you've been to a lot of places, but inside of the United States, you've traveled to a lot of American cities, right? Yeah. Well, um, I grew up in uh, between small town and rural Montana, and um, I was homeschooled for most of the time. So when my dad uh, got time off of work, a lot of times what we'd do is hit the road and take the schoolwork with us. And we'd um, go visit family members on the other side of the country. So like my uncle lived in Massachusetts. Uh, my mom had relatives that lived in Washington, D.C. We had people that lived in New Mexico. And then also, uh, when my parents were able to save up a little bit of money, we did the whole uh, Florida trip and did Disney World and Space Camp, actually, when I was 12. And we drove there all the way from Montana. So, like, we stopped a lot of ways. How, so I've how, actually, long did it take, how long does it take to drive from Montana to Florida? Well, I mean, normally I think it'd be about a three to four day trip, but we've made a lot of stops on the way, you know. And it was actually really cool because, I mean, my mom and dad tried to make it really educational. So they were kind of like field trips, you know. And um, I think we ended up taking you know, about a week to get to Florida. And we spent two or three weeks uh, in Florida. And then, of course, we did the drive back and everything. And we did Massachusetts a couple times. Um, we did California one time, I think, too. So, and then when I graduated from college, me and a friend of ours also did a long road trip. We went uh, from Washington to Michigan and then went down uh, back to San Francisco and then back up. So I've been to every state in the United States except for Hawaii and Alaska. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> That's so. crazy, man. Um, and, and I met you in Seattle and mm -hmm. I know that after all of your vacations, all of your travels, all the different crazy places you've been, you keep going back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, how does Seattle stand out for you? What is, what is so special about that place that keeps bringing you back? Well, probably some of it is nostalgia, but you know, when um, I was gonna go to college, I wasn't really looking at any particular college. In fact, I was kind of on the fence if I wanted to go to college at the time. Uh, but my mom was insisting on it and, um, you know, I didn't have any problem getting into college. I, even being homeschooled, I, the way it works in Montana, you have to take a GED, um, but it's still considered like you graduated from a private school and then all the applications and stuff I did well with. Uh, in those days, I don't think people take it anymore, but you could either take the GED or the SAT and I took the GED and did fairly well in it. Uh, so my idea was, well, if I got to do this thing, I'm going to go someplace where I want to live. And at the time, uh, I was really into grunge and Jimi Hendrix. So I kind of wanted to go to the birthplace of those things. And um, uh, it wasn't that far from home. Like I wanted to get the hell out of Montana, but uh, I didn't want to be that far from my family. And also one of the road trips we did, um, I don't remember how old I was, but we did a trip through the Olympic National Forest. And I just remember loving the scenery and everything so much in Western Washington. And I was like, man, I want to live here someday. So it was kind of those combination. And so even now, I mean, you know, it was my many formative years in Seattle college. I ended up loving college. In fact, after going, uh, I didn't even want to leave. It was kind of funny. It was like a whole 180 after that. Um, but, uh, I just, you know, I really love how beautiful the city is, even though it's, you know, gray most of the time, like, there's just nothing like, for example, like going down, uh, Pine or Pike or one of the streets, um, that goes down into the international district and seeing the sunset over the sound with all those mountains behind them, you know, and, um, still have a lot of good friends there. I just... I like, I don't know, the architecture of the city and kind of 
the crazy crisscrossness of how it's uh, it's organized and um, yeah, all the little coffee shops and artistic places and um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me to describe everything. The last time I was there, I, I went by myself. It was kind of a, not the last time, the time before last. I ended up uh, kind of making an impromptu trip to the United States and I went through Vancouver and then down to Seattle and I was only going to spend a couple of days there, but I ended up spending a week. And one of the things that uh, kind of hit me was waking up in the morning there and Seattle even has like a smell to it. It's only Seattle. I don't know. And uh, it just made me feel really nostalgic. So, uh, you know, it's Seattle's, a f I mean, I, I guess we'll get to talking about it. Uh, all right, we're talking about it now, but Seattle's a funny place, you know, because um, I, um, you know, I'm a, kind of a radical and a, that's a big part of my life is, um, is uh, activism and stuff. And Seattle's funny because it, it's thought of as this very kind of progressive leftist place, but at the same time, it's very corporate. I mean, you've got uh, Starbucks and Microsoft and Boeing and, um, uh, and Amazon that are all there. So it's, it's this kind of, it's got this contradiction of this at the same time. So there's there are things about it that I don't miss, but there are things about it that I, I do miss. I don't know. It's changed a lot too. So I don't know if I could go back there now because it's not really the same city it was when we were there, you know? Yeah. And and your story about choosing where to go to college is actually very similar to mine. Like, yeah. I didn't know where I wanted to go to college. I wasn't even really thinking about it. And then one year when I was in high school, my, my grandma decided to take me on a road trip. And we went up into the Olympic Peninsula. We went out to the San Juan Islands. We went on uh, almost all of the different ferries in a week. Wow. And I was just struck by the, the beauty of the place. And we spent a couple days in Seattle, but only only a couple days out of the week. But mm -hmm. the, the the just insane beauty of the of the area, and I think for me the special part about Seattle is like what you were saying about it having so many contradictions. Like, yeah. um, it's a it's a big city. It's it's a pretty big city for the United States, but it's also in the middle of so much natural beauty that it doesn't, some parts of it just don't make sense. Like, how could it, you it have so? <laughs> I mean, I, there's a saying that I think it's really fitting. Maybe that's what puts Seattle in the, in the, in the nutshell. It's like, it's either uh, the country's littlest big city or the biggest small town. Uh, it kind of has a little bit of a of feeling of both, you know? And then after living in Sao Paulo, when I go back, I'm like, oh, it's like a little mini city in comparison, you know? <laughs> But uh, like Erica, my wife, who's Brazil, who's from Sao Paulo, who's probably Stana, um, you know, when we go there, she's just like, I can't believe how easy it is to walk down the sidewalk here, you know. Um, but it, I mean, it's not just that. It's all the trees and the views, all the mountains and the sound and the lakes and everything. I mean, I think there's very few cities that you can see that has, it has kind of like the perfect, for me, the perfect balance between the two. Like you have everything that you'd want from a cosmopolitan city. But at the same time, you have all this natural beauty. Uh, and for me, it's just the right size. Like, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I've been in Sao Paulo now for seven years, and it's pretty cool. But it gets to be pretty overwhelming. Like, it's too much stimulation sometimes. And um, for me, Seattle has just the right size. I mean, the city itself isn't even a million metropolitan, or it used to be at least. I don't know what it is now, um, about two million. But uh, it's just, you know, it's just big enough to have what you want, but not so big that you feel suffocated. Mm -hmm. Sure. And Rodrigo, what, do you have any questions? <clears throat> I do. I have a question about uh, Seattle still, and then um, some other questions, because uh, Tom, you told us that you, 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 were, you were born in Montana, right? Mm -hmm. You grew up in Montana. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have some questions about Montana because I really know very little about it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Seattle, I heard way too much because I, I too am in love with uh, grunge music and Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. uh, not Starbucks so much, but uh, I love lots of things that come from Seattle. Ryan, uh, uh, right? He's oh, from yeah. Seattle, and I love him. Yeah. I like him. Uh, 
so I can stand it. So uh, my question is, you, you, you said something about activism, your background, mm -hmm. right? And you said, um, you also said um, about how Seattle is corporate, is big and there's what Microsoft, Amazon, Starbucks. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that the activism is because the corporate aspect of the city or it's unrelated? You know, that's an interesting question. I hadn't really thought about that, but um, I think that very much could have something to do with it because Seattle has this, I used to, I used to work at this uh, nonprofit in Seattle. They had a, a thing with our university where you could do like work study, but it had a very radical background. The place was called um, El Centro de la Raza and Raza in this context is from the Chicano movement, which means more like people like Opovo, um, then it really means like race. But um, the way that this nonprofit started is, is that it was a group of um, kind of Latino social workers and other groups that occupied an empty um, school and convinced the city to sell it to them for a dollar so they could start a, a community services um, organization. And the reason why the school was abandoned and why they were trying to open this is because um, Seattle's gone through a lot of waves of gentrification like what'll happen is there'll be some type of in industry boom. Like uh, I think it was the aerospace industry at one point because of Boeing. And then um, in the kind of late eighties, early nineties, it was the tech boom, the first tech boom, you know, with Microsoft. And now we're seeing another one with the Am with uh, Amazon expansion. And what happens in these booms is, is that at the same time, it brings a lot of people in high paying jobs. And it also brings in these kind of huge, um, uh, apartment and condo construction uh, project, uh, like, uh, you know, construction in different neighborhoods. And that raises up all the prices of the rent and the food and everything. And so a lot of people who've lived in these neighborhoods, like their whole lives, like could be like people who live there for generations, get pushed out because they can't, um, can't afford to live there anymore uh, because of the, the whole gentrification process. And that very well could have a lot to do with um, why there's so much radicalism in Seattle. Um, is this, this kind of uh, the effects of these waves of these huge, um, these huge booms and, and busts? Because what ended up happening a lot of times, uh, what I've seen there is, is that, I mean, I lived there from the early 2000s until uh, about for about that whole decade, you know, the first decade of the 2000s. And what, uh, so I kind of lived there, we lived there kind of in between the booms, but what I've seen in talking to the old timers, what happens a lot of times is a lot of prospect, like uh, real estate prospectors come in uh, because of these booms and everything. And they, and they push all these people out and build these, uh, these expensive uh, apartments and condos, and then nobody buys them. Uh, like they way overshoot what they think it's gonna be. And so they end up becoming, uh, a lot of times end up becoming low income housing afterwards. But at that point, they've already ch totally changed the character of the neighborhood. They've totally pushed out um, people uh, that lived in that neighborhood before. And so, you know, that, I think that's probably one of the factors. And then, you know, just the whole West Coast, uh, for one reason or another, it has that characteristic. I mean, it's interesting when you go to like uh, Oregon, where Ryan grew up, or Washington, and on the West, you know, it's like all, all hippies and commies, you know, but then you go a little bit further to the East and it's like total uh, right wing. Everybody has an American flag in their in front of their house, you know, drives a huge gus a gas guzzling pickup. Um, but the, the kind of population is mostly centered in the cities. Uh, so that's something that the whole East, the whole West Coast kind of has for it, like, you know, San Francisco. I don't know, maybe it's for the same reason, because the story uh, from like uh, early from the colonization until now between San Francisco, Portland, uh, Seattle, and even Vancouver, Canada, has been pretty similar. So I think it might be the whole boom and bust cycle, but maybe is, you know, I mean, this is just kind of my, from what I know, the history of the area, what would my guess would be. I couldn't really give you a full answer as to why that, but you know, um, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. And um, what about Montana? Is it an activist state? Well, you know, Montana is a funny place uh, because you think of it as being very conservative and it, it can be, 
But uh, they have the saying, at least with the electoral politics, that they say they send Republicans to Washington, but Democrats to Helena, which is the capital. And um, it has this kind of strange cultural divide between the eastern part and the western part of the state, but it's not like the coastal states where uh, the population is centered on a, on a certain city. Um, it's more like the whole state is almost bisected. And uh, there, well, there's a continental divide goes through Montana, which is um, where the Rocky Mountains uh, kind of split where the rivers go. So on one side of it, the rivers go towards the east until they hit, you know, all the way down to the east coast or the Gulf of Mexico or, you know, that side of the country. And then on the west side, they all go to the west coast. Um, and it's this, uh, where the mountain range has some really uh, high peaks. Um, in fact, like having to go back and forth between uh, where my mom's parents lived and where my parents grew up and then where I grew up, we'd have to go over several mountain ranges to get there. Uh, but this one in particular, and my mom had this theory, I don't know if it's true or not, but she, <laughs> she used to say that the people on the west side were generally more progressive and kind of more open because uh, during the pioneer days, uh, the, the people who were too scared to go over the mountain stayed on the east side, and then the adventurers went on to the west side. I don't know if that's true or not, but it could also just be like the west kind of being closer to the, um, to the coast and having more interaction with the cities on the coast and the east kind of being more with the, connected to the Midwest, you know? Because like, Montana is so small, we don't even have professional sports teams. Like usually what happens is the people on the west side when it comes to American football, will um, cheer for the Seattle Seahawks and then the people on the east part of the state will, will cheer for the Denver, Bron Denver Broncos, you know? But how far so, away, how far away are these distances? Like your, your town is on the east side, right? Mm -hmm. And how far away is that from Denver? Like if you wanted to go to Denver to see a football game, how far would you have to travel? Well, I, yeah, I don't know uh, the mileage, but you know, it's funny because in a place like Montana where everything's so far, we usually talk about things in terms of like driving time. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like, uh, it's a good like 14, 15 hour drive. I mean, it's almost the same distance from Denver to Seattle from where yeah. I live, you know, as far as driving time goes. Um, so, you know, the, uh, most people don't even go like, you know, to these cities, like where I, I grew up a little bit on both sides, actually, we moved around a lot, because um, my dad went to different places for different job opportunities. I spent most of the time on the east side, but my parents are from the west side of the state. Uh, and where we ended up in the end was uh, my mom ended up buying a farm um, on the east part, because that's where she could kind of find the best property at the price range that she had that had the best uh, climate that she wanted and the, and the type of soil that she was looking for. Uh, and the closest town is called Belfry, and it has a population of 210, or at least it did at the last census. And uh, we always joke that they were counting the dogs, too, because it really is just 210. really small. I, I think that there's more people in my apartment building. Than yes, oh, yeah. There, for sure. Yeah. I think half of my block has more people in it than, than Belfry, you know? <laughs> Uh, so like, you know, we'd have to drive an hour to go grocery shopping, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. we'd go up to Costco and load up the Suburban, you know, this big SUV that my parents had, and that would be like our monthly, uh, our monthly purchases. So, you know, you can't really imagine a more different place than Sao Paulo. Uh, like, uh, you know, when I would go out when I was younger, my parents would get worried if I didn't come back home at time, not because they were really worried about me driving drunk or anything, but because they're like, if I did have an accident, uh, it could like, you know, be hours and hours before anybody would even drive by. Uh, it's pretty isolated uh, where they live. And my parents still live out there. They still have the farm. My sister lives out there with them too. Um, and it's actually been a good thing right now with uh, the whole pandemic and everything. But uh, no, it, uh, sounds really, it sounds really similar, uh, kind of, to where my grandma lives in Northern Idaho which would be yeah. more similar to the Western part of um, Montana, I think, because yeah. this area is more green and mountainous and has trees and forests, but it's still forever from anything. Like recently she's had some, some health problems and has to go to the hospital. And okay, the nearest town does have a hosp hospital, but it's more like a clinic 
they don't really have facilities there to do anything. So mm -hmm. for her to go to a real hospital, she has to either go to Seattle or Portland, which mm -hmm. is like uh, eight or if she if she's driving because she's kind of crazy, it's a six hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know fun fact you go ahead sorry but that's still kind of like mind-blowing i think that you there are people living all across the united states in these towns that are like half a day's travel from a real hospital yeah i mean for somebody living in sao paulo probably because i mean here i had to have a i had to have surgery at the end of last year and i literally walked to the hospital um, you know, it ended up being emergency surgery. I didn't even know I was going to need it, but I was having problems. I was like, okay, we'll walk down to the hospital. But if I would have still been in Montana, you know, it would have been like at least an hour before I would have been able to get to the hospital, you know, but like even there's like places like where you're, where, uh, she lives, like where, um, it would have been much longer, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different reality. I was going to say, you were talking about the way she drives. Uh, I don't know if Puerto Rico knows this, but there was one time when I was growing up in Montana where we didn't have a speed limit. Um, we, well, we had a speed limit. It was called safe and prudent, which basically <laughs> meant that you could decide what the speed limit should be. Or in practical terms, what it really meant was the highway patrol had to decide. And, and they would say, like, they'd, you know, they'd analyze your car as you drove past. So if you were, like, driving... 100 miles an hour in a Volkswagen Beetle from 1969, then probably that was a little too fast, you know. <laughs> but uh, it didn't work out very long. Of course, if you ask the Montanans, it wasn't because of the Montana drivers, it was because of all the outer staters that just, you know, yes. uh, went crazy. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was the Wild West. But to answer your question about activism, um, you know, it's funny because, like, for example, when Citizens United came, uh, happened in the United States, which was this decision that, um, the Supreme Federal Supreme Court made that said that corporations could contribute as much money as they wanted to candidates uh, because it was free speech. The Montana Supreme Court actually uh, made a ruling against that and they tried to make it so that wouldn't be the case um, in the state. But at the same time, it can be very conservative. My mom is an activist too. Uh, I mean, she wasn't really when I was growing up, but well, uh, yes and no, but. Um, she, she's an anti-fracking activist uh, because they've been trying to do uh, hydraulic fracturing where they uh, basically inject high speed uh, mixture of chemicals and water into, um, eh, I, I forgot the, the technical term, but you know, the, the rocky um, uh, layers uh, uh, under the ground uh, to extract natural gas or oil. And a lot of times what happens is the chemicals they use, which they don't reveal because they're proprietary uh, mixtures that uh, they're supposed to be like uh, trade secrets for the, the companies, get mixed into the water table and it could contaminate the water that she uses for her organic farm. And uh, the reception between the other farms, between her activities has been either mixed between people who have supported her or people who have called her like a communist. Uh, and it's like, go to Cuba, you know, like, um, and just like, I, I think she might've even got some death threats. Um, and uh, she also has like uh, people like, like watching her from the, uh, the dirt road and stuff like in unmarked vehicles, like smoking cigarettes and watching her while she farms and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's, it's funny, it's, 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 kind of, um, it's kind of split between, uh, you know, I, I kind of split between, I guess, progressive and conservative when he really comes down to it. Uh, but I, you know, me growing up, um, I think, you know, my family wasn't terribly political when I was growing up, though uh, my mom, she had been in this protracted lawsuit with the largest corporation in the state um, for, because uh, um, uh, they fired her for some medical uh, issues that she had. And uh, she had one of her best friends was an old union organizer from uh, a mining town, which was um, at the time one of the richest towns in the country. People uh, didn't know about, a lot of people don't know this, but Butte, Montana, which um, now people go there to see this huge mining pit that they have. Um, but uh, it was, a, it was a kind of with the workers' movements in the beginning of the 20th century, it was a big, um, important area for that. So I grew up listening to her stories about her uh, dad and her growing up, uh, you know, organizing. And then my mom fighting this big corporation. And my parents actually were more kind of right of center when I was growing up. Like, uh, but uh, that's changed now. But um, 
you know, Montana has its own uh, interesting heritage. It's very libertarian in a lot of ways, but not necessarily right-wing libertarian, just kind of libertarian in the, like, you know, I do my thing and you do your thing and we'll just, you know, we're cool of people doing their own thing. Um, especially on the west side, I don't know, growing up on the east part in the small towns, it, it, it could be a little bit cliquish, you know, like the... Um, the rural area where I lived in, uh, all the towns were named after families who'd been there for a couple generations. And like, if you weren't there for like two or three generations, you were considered an outsider and everybody gossiped about everybody. So that kind of idea of like a small town, everybody being friends and good neighbors, uh, it's not necessarily how it always works out, but it really just depends. I mean, it's, it depends on the town, it depends on the part of the state you're in um, and everything. So, okay. You know. uh, now, so cliche but you you said many 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 things about Seattle you made me in a way that I, everybody would would like to go uh, tell me about your hometown in a very in a very uh, how can I say? Just use two, uh, like I'm trying to do with you what I do with my students. Just use two or three words, two or three very beautiful adjectives to describe Montana or your town. Okay. Let me go with Montana since I grew up in multiple towns there. Okay. I'd say big spaces, few people, and lots of cows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Big spaces, few uh -huh. people, and lots of cows. Yeah. It's like Mato Grosso here in Brazil. Yeah, it's exactly, I, that's the, the, the comparison that I make. <laughs> and what, um, what did your parents grow? You said they got a farm and she wanted specialized soil for something specific. What, yeah. what was it? What were they growing? What was their farm of? Well, um, and, I mean, they're still growing stuff there, but um, what my mom really wanted was an orchard. And uh, it's interesting because most of the farms around there today uh, grow sugar beets and barley for, um, for beer and, and uh, corn. Uh, but she knew that the, the, the climate and there was something about like the pH balance of the soil would be really good for fruit. And then she found out after she started doing this that about a hundred years ago, it used to be all orchards. Um, but uh, also another thing that she grows is hard knit garlic, which is a little bit different from the garlic that you get say in Brazil, because uh, the, the ground has to freeze for it to grow. Uh, and it's from originally from areas like uh, Siberia and Korea. Um, it, it tends to be a little bit spicier than, uh, and flavorful than the, the soft knit garlic, which is what you get in Brazil. Uh, and then she grows herbs um, too, and we grew a lot of potatoes too, uh, which ended up being kind of a pain in the ass because we found out that there's a, rel a wild relative of potato that doesn't produce the root like a potato does, but the farmers there uh, brought in a bunch of potato beetles to try to get rid of this weed, and then of course they love potato plants. Uh, so, and then being an organic farm, I, we used to have to go out there when I was a kid and put on gloves and squish them individually. On the, the beetles, on the you have to go grab yeah. the beetles and squish them. Yeah, I was like, a, it was like a, a, I was a beetle mass murderer growing up uh, on this farm. Uh, we, we we moved there when I was thirteen, so I mean, I spent my adolescent years there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what she did was a lot of what she focused on, for the most part, was she grew herbs like basil, oregano, thyme, um, and uh, and then garlic, and she made these um, these. Uh, uh, like oils, like uh, with uh, garlic and herbs, or salt seasonings, uh, and uh, she named the um, the company. Here's a good one for for English students: On Time Gourmet. But the time is the herb, uh, so it's like a pun. And of course, Ryan can attest to the flavor of these things because I used to get bucket loads of them and, and cook with it. It's amazing. It was delicious, wasn't it? Unfortunately, actually, I actually still have a little bit of the salt. I'm, oh yeah, I'm like guarding it with my life and spending it on very special meals. It's uh -huh. almost gone, but not quite, not quite. Um, but 
we have to take a, a short break for a moment. Okay. But we'll be right back with some more, some more Tom and telling us some stories about Mexico, Korea, and then giving us a good comparison between his, his whole life and what he thinks now about living in Brazil. So stick with us and we'll be right back in just a second. Hello everybody, this is Rodrigo and I'm talking to you from my bedroom where Ryan and Rodrigo Magic happens. I mean the podcast recording, of course. To remind you to subscribe to our channel, we have a new grammar session, a new discussion session, grammar, present continues this week, adjectives next week, discussion, politics, COVID-19, Brazil, America, all the horrible and great outcomes we had. So remember to subscribe and watch our all new contents, okay? Thank you, guys. Here's a new transition. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. And we're here with my very good friend, Tom. And we've been talking about Seattle and Montana and all the interesting places he's lived throughout his life. And next, I want to ask him about Mexico. Um, Tom, you studied abroad in Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. And how, how long did you live there? How long did you spend in Mexico? Uh, I was there for six months, uh, my sophomore year of college, first two quarters. And, and why did you choose Mexico? I assume you had many choices. There were many options for you to go, right? Actually not. Oh, um, okay. uh, well, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more when we talk about Brazil, but when I was living in Montana, um, my best friend for a couple years, I mean, he's still a good friend of mine, was a Brazilian exchange student. And um, uh, what happened was is that where I was living in Montana, there was a woman that uh, really loved the idea of foreign exchange. She had hosted one exchange student. And then she convinced all these families to take on uh, exchange students. And my family ended up being one, though we, the exchange student that we had was from Mexico. Um, but uh, close to the farm I lived on, um, there's a woman that adopted, uh, not adopted, but hosted two exchange students, and one of them was from Santo Andre. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I also had another friend from the neighboring town who was an exchange student from Sao Paulo. And uh, I got along really well with them. I ended up, uh, when I was 17, coming here, um, staying in Santo Andre, but we basically we've spent a lot of time in Sao Paulo just kind of fell in love with everything and wanted to learn Portuguese. But the university we went to didn't have Portuguese. So kind of my plan was, well, I'm gonna learn Spanish so I can learn Portuguese later. And the Seattle University had a program in, uh, within the Seattle University is a Jesuit university. And they had a program, exchange program with another Jesuit university in, in Puebla, Mexico. I didn't really wanna to go to Mexico actually at first because I felt it was too close to home, like, and, you know, I, I hate to admit it, but you kind of have these kind of stereotypical ideas of Mexico sometimes growing up in the U.S. And um, I didn't really think it would be that interesting of a place, which turned out to be completely wrong um, of all the places I've been to. Uh, and this is not to put down the other places, but I just think in terms of the culture and the history, Mexico was actually the most fascinating place I've been to. Um, and... Um, it just has such a rich history and such a rich culture. You know, uh, Mexico used to be a bunch of different indigenous nations and that diversity is still reflected in how it is today, along with a lot of different European and even African influences. Um, and it, there's just no other place like it. Uh, but uh, that was the reason why I ended up going there was because the university had an exchange program there. And like, it was easier to get all the credits and it kind of was just easier to set everything up. and. I think it was going to be cheaper too and everything um, like you, the SU uh, tuition actually partially covered the, um, the, uh, the study abroad and everything. So there were still other expenses that we had to pay, but um, it was going to be easier for my family and everything for me to do that. And the goal was just to learn Spanish. So I needed to go someplace where they spoke Spanish. Um, okay. And so that's what we ended up doing. Cool. And you said that you traveled to, to Brazil a couple of years before, but mm -hmm. this study abroad to Mexico, was it your, was it your first like extensive stay outside the United States? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I came to Brazil, I stayed here for five weeks. Um, but uh, it was the first time I'd really kind of 
lived and, and did something like uh, in another country. So and how, how was that? How was the transition? How was adapting to a new culture? How was it the first time that you, that you did it? Because after it, you lived in Korea for some time and now you've lived in Brazil for several years. How was the very yeah. first time that you had to make that adaptation? You know, it was probably a little bit easier because I went with a bunch of friends from school, which was an advantage and a disadvantage because if you really wanted to, you didn't have to engage uh, with the local culture. And then uh, Puebla, when we got there, I found out kind of has a reputation for the rest of Mexico of having people who kind of have a tendency more to, to uh, stay within the same group of friends that they've had since they were childhood. They can be kind of cliquish, I guess they say, in, in, in Puebla. But we still, you know, got to know a lot of people, um, we had Mexican friends. Um, you know, we also made friends with the other exchange students, and a lot of times we had to speak Spanish between them, although most of them also spoke English. I ended up having a group of Brazilian friends when I was there, too, who were from Recife. Um, so kind of everywhere I go, I seem to kind of run into Brazilians. But... Um, you know, that it, but at the same time, it was, I mean, I don't know. It's been so many years now, too, man. I mean, it's hard to believe this, but it's been like 15 or more years since I went there. But um, I think the hardest thing, actually, for us was the food, really. Because I like Mexican food, and the food in Pueblo is good. But it was just like having that every day. Uh, we got, like, I, I kind of, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss the food I was used to, you know. Um, and then we had some problems with our ho first host family too, like they kind of pocketed the money that we gave them that was supposed to cover some of our expenses and didn't give us food and stuff. So we kind of ended up kind of starving the first like couple of months. Um, and that probably didn't help. And we had a hard time communicating like the problems that we had because we didn't speak any Spanish and stuff. Uh, I mean, I actually, my roommate did, he spoke fluent Spanish already, but even so it was like, we were trying not to offend anybody. We were trying to be open and everything. Uh, the second host family that we had was wonderful. So it's not like they were representative of, of uh, Mexican or Puebla families in general. Uh, it just kind of happened to be the way that things worked out. Um, but, uh, you know, that and then I think, um, you know, uh, it's funny because being American, I get this other places, but in Puebla specifically, not necessarily the rest of Mexico, but you kind of get this. Thing where people either loved you because you were American like oh you know because all the TV shows they would movies they watch and everything and kind of a lot of middle and upper class people like that's their like what they want they want to be American they want to go to the US and everything or else people hated you because like there's kind of a complicated history between the US and Mexico right and that was during the Iraq war which was not very popular in Mexico too and stuff um, so uh, it would kind of be like you go to a party and they'd be like oh American, we love you. Or it'd be like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, sorry, but you know, like, get out of my face, uh, you gringo bastard. You know, so uh, that was kind of interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, though, I think we kind of it was more like being kid, basically kids, and like being away from home for a long time. I think was more of the difficulty than it was. I mean, even though I didn't live at home anymore, I was living far away from my family still with the place I was used to, with the culture I was used to. I think it was more just kind of feeling out of place than it was differences with the culture. But one of the things that helped was uh, one of my friends that I went with, um, she, her father was from a suburb of Mexico City, which was not very far from where we're living. Pueblo is about a two hour drive uh, south of Mexico City. And so we would spend a lot of time there and the family was just like, so great they basically like adopted us you know like when my parents came to visit they insisted that they stay with them um, and they would take us around to different places we'd go around the city with them and uh, just this really wonderful welcoming family and that was cool because we kind of got an experience of what Mexican family life was like that you know and at least uh, you know for them and uh, you know very tight-knit family very affectionate uh, you know like in that case, we got lots of food, um, you know, lots of good food and stuff. And uh, so um, that was really cool. Uh, I think that was one of the best parts. I'm still in touch with them, not that much. Uh, I haven't been back since I studied there, uh, though I'd love to. I'd love to take my wife there because, like I said, Mexico is just such a fascinating place and the people are great. 
you know, my parents who were kind of country bumpkins, you know, uh, they even loved it. I mean, my parents who hate big cities, they loved Mexico City. Like, um, and so, and people were just very helpful and welcoming. I mean, even within Mexico, Mexico City has this kind of reputation of being this like dangerous big place. But when we were there, like, uh, you know, we had to take the bus to the, back to the suburb to stay with the family we were with. And like, it was kind of like, hard trying to figure out which street to stop by and everything because it's kind of like Santo Andre where the streets kind of go in weird directions and like a lot of the neighborhoods look the same and stuff and uh I knew how to get there but like there would always be people on the bus like oh do you know where you are do you know where you're going like can we help you and like not like trying to get anything from us you know um so I found Mexican people to be generally very open and welcoming and um just all around decent, cool people. And very like, uh, you know, um, another thing like uh, to totally like um, undid like all the stereotypes that you kind of grew up with in the United States about Mexico is uh, Mexico actually like per cap uh, in general has the people who work the longest, uh, some of the longest hours in the world actually. Uh, people in Mexico work a lot um, and uh, you know, for not very good pay, but, uh, uh, you know, like, um, my host, first host mom was kind of a semi retired teacher, but she was still working all the time and, and everything. Uh, so, you know, life in Mexico is, it's not necessarily that easy, uh, for a lot of people. Um, uh, people have to work a lot to get by, but, um, they still like, uh, just, you know, and it's interesting because going back to the indigenous times, there's this kind of almost fatalistic outlook, you know, um, where like, uh, you know, life ends in death and, and uh, there's this very conscious kind of, the culture has a very uh, conscious idea of death, but I think maybe partially for that reason, like they, they want to enjoy life, you know, like people really, I think, know how to enjoy life and like they take all the, the Catholic saint days pretty serious, you know, and so like there's uh, lots of parties. There were always fireworks going off where I lived and everything like that. Um, and uh just a really rich culture because it was this really interesting marriage between um, uh, European and indigenous culture. And next to Puebla is a town called Cholula, which has the largest pyramid in the world. Uh, yeah, a lot of people don't know this, uh, but they have the largest pyramid in the world. It's bigger than the pyramids at Giza, but it's buried because what happened was, um, the, when the Catholic uh, missionaries came and the, the Spanish conquistadors, they decided like, well, we're not going to tear this thing down. So they buried it and built a church on top of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is very Catholic. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and they haven't completely unburied the, the, uh, this pyramid yet. Um, but uh, you can go inside of it. We, we went through this one chamber and everything one time. But you know, me and my friend, we used to catch the bus and go to have a drink uh, and sit like in the, they, they have the, in all, every Mexican city has what they call the, the Socolo, which is the historic center. And it's usually still preserved with all the colonial buildings and everything. And so we'd go sit there and like in front of a colonial architecture bar uh, with the pyramid in view and, and just be there drinking our, our um, you know, nobody drinks Corona in this part of Mexico, but that's for the tourists. Uh, we drink our, our souls and our, they have a soul, the company that makes soul has this other beer that's really good. It's called Indio. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, enjoy the, the view of, the, of the, the pyramid. And we did a lot of traveling. Um, part of the program that I did at the end of this, the school courses, we did this kind of tour of southern Mexico. And there are pyramids everywhere in Mexico. Like you go down the highway and there's pyramids on the side of the street. Uh, it's a lot of things that a lot of people don't know, but um, there's a huge, arc, there's, you know, all these archaeological sites everywhere. I mean, one of the things I love about Mexico City, like Mexico City is my favorite city, I think, of all the places I've been. The only reason why I wouldn't want to live there is because of the pollution. But um, like the Socolo in, in, in Mexico, like you have this huge Catholic cathedral, like kind of, it's not really technically Gothic, but very Gothic-like. And then right next to it is the pyramid, one of the pyramids for the, what was the capital of the Aztec empire. And they're like, you know, excavating it still um, right there in the middle of the city. Uh, so like, there's no place in the world like that. I mean, imagine like you're in the biggest, like one of the biggest cities in the world and you're sitting next to this archeological um, 
you know, excavation while you're eating your enchiladas. Very cool. Um, before we, before I move on to the next place, can you like quickly try to tell me, is there something from your experience in Mexico that you've held on to that's changed maybe a habit in your daily life or a part of who you are or, or something about you that you've kept all these years later? Hmm. Let me think here for a second. Well, you know, like I said, um, I had a lot of preconceived notions. So I think one of it is, is like, never think that you know something about a place until you've really been there, I think is, is uh, and, and also, um, you know, having studied and worked and studied there and lived for a long time, that you can't really, I mean, I don't know how much you can ever really get to know a place, but you can't really get a good grasp on what a place is about unless you, um, uh, you spend an extended amount of time there. And that's, I think, the reason why I ended up doing Korea the way I did, why I, I kind of I looked for a, a place where I could work outside the country because I wanted to have that type of experience again. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, like when I travel, uh, I haven't really, I mean, also for economic reasons, I haven't really gotten to travel as a tourist in many places. But generally the way I try to do it is to go to one or two few places and spend a decent amount of time there. I don't like doing the type of tourism where you're like, okay, let's go to this spot and let's go to this spot and let's go to this spot. Um, uh, Cause you, you just get a real superficial feel for it like that, where you're trying to just go to all the different towns that have tourist uh, spots. And also, um, you know, trying to get to know locals, I think is, is also another thing like, you know, um, it didn't really work out for me in Korea so much that way to a certain extent it did. But instead of like trying to hang out with uh, other tourists and stuff, usually what I try to, although I have met a lot of really cool travelers um, in, in hostels and stuff, but I also try, you know, to get to know some local people or I try to go places where I have a connection with local people. Because, uh, and I think that was all kind of do somewhat to my to experience here my first experience here in brazil but even more so my experience in mexico you know I, I don't think we would have had the same experience that we did and i say we because i spent a lot of time with my friend jared who was my roommate there who was another really good friend of mine from seattle university um but i don't think we would have had the same experience if we wouldn't have had that friend of ours who had family in mexico that we spent time with so cool yeah i think it's that those those things definitely nice um, hey, Rodrigo, there, do you have anything? Yeah, yeah, sure. Tom, uh, you told us that you live in you you you've also lived in Korea, right? Mm -hmm. South Korea, of course. Right. Yeah, uh, they don't let, they don't let uh, screen goes into North Korea. <laughs> yeah, they won't like it that much. Um, so, um, I know that you are a Tai Chi instructor, right? Mm -hmm. And a student, of course, practitioner, and. Uh, was did you find out about Tai Chi in Korea, or did you? Um, I don't know how 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 did Korea influence you in, in that way in that part? And I know you you also like very much um, uh, their philosophy, right? Not Korean philosophy specifically, but Western philosophy, uh, Eastern philosophy. Yeah. Well, you know, Tai Chi uh, actually. Did you, did oh, you get in ahead. touch with them? No, no, sorry, that, that's it, you can, you can go on. Yeah, I mean, actually, it, it's a funny story, but um, I did. Uh, but, but my interest in Tai Chi didn't come from being in Korea. Um, I, when I was at Seattle University, um, we, the Jesuit universities, they kind of require every area, that, well, regardless of what area you study, you have to take uh, courses in multiple areas, and they, uh, require you to take theology, but uh, being at our university, um, we had the option to take like Eastern um, religions and Buddhism and stuff like that. And where I'd grown up uh, in an evangelical church and my mom's side of the family was Catholic, I wasn't really that interested in, in learning about that because I already kind of knew things. I'm just, a, uh, I was going to say, but I had plenty of things about uh, kind of that, um, those religions. I went, and I always was curious about Buddhism because um, I never knew anything about it. So I ended up taking um, 
course on Buddhism and then a course on Eastern religions that included Taoism. And the second one, we went to go, we went to a Taoist uh, kind of school temple in Seattle. And this guy showed us um, some things about Tai Chi. And it was funny because he picked out the biggest guy in our group and he was like, come here and try to push me. And this guy, the guy was the, 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 the Taoist center guy was very tall, but he was very skinny and he looked like a twig. And uh, he picked out this guy who looked like a football player, like just huge. And he was like, okay, try to push me. And like the guy couldn't move him, you know? And I kind of just, uh, I grew up doing martial arts. Actually, I grew up doing Korean, a Korean martial art, uh, Taekwondo. But I got to be really fascinated with Tai Chi after that. Also because it had um, more of the, f more, I mean, Taekwondo has a lot of the philosophy, but it's become more of a kind of a sport, you know, a focus uh, that it's been taught in. Um, where Tai Chi is very philosophical. So, and it's more connected to uh, Taoism, which was really kind of the religion slash philosophy that most appealed to me uh, out of all the ones I learned about. And then there was the whole health thing. Uh, and so when I graduated from college, like I, I wanted to learn more about these philosophies. And um, I also knew I needed to start being more active because I was kind of getting older and I'd like to party a lot when I was in, uh, in college and it kind of started to catch up with me. So I was like, all right, well, I should do something that's interesting to me, you know, like that has something to do with kind of the more intellectual stuff. So I went to a school in Seattle first and I took a, a Tai Chi and then a, a Buddhist um, form of Qigong, which is, you know, like the um, another type of exercise. Tai Chi is actually both a martial art and Qigong. Um, it, it, it's a martial art that incorporates Qigong uh, uh, dynamics and, and principles. But uh, then when I went to Korea, I spent a year there and then I was like, uh, I, I want to get back into this. And I walked past a place that was on the other side of the street of where my apartment was. It had a big banner that said uh, Korea Tai Chi. So with my like very rudimentary Korean, I went up there and I was like, uh, with my book, like and everything. I think it was like the Lonely Planet guide that had like some phrases and then like some things I'd written down or that I had a... I didn't have a smartphone at the time. Um, I like went in there and tried to like say in Korean, like, uh, I want to learn Tai Chi. And there happened to be a student there that spoke English. So he like translated for me and the teacher. And um, uh, so I started taking classes uh, with this guy that lived across, that had his school across the street from me. And he turned out to be this really interesting guy. He's not much older. He's not much older than I am. Um, uh, and, uh, but somehow he did already done so many things in his life. He, he was, he taught two forms of Tai Chi. He had a black belt in Taekwondo. Uh, and he had learned like, like hardcore Taekwondo, not like a lot of times Taekwondo in Korea is kind of like little league baseball in the U S uh, it's like what people do when they're kids. Uh, and like, uh, in the military, supposedly you have to have a black belt after a year, but it's like the, like the express black belt that they do in their military training. Um, and then, uh, he, w uh, he was a chiropractor too, a certified chiropractor, a swimming instructor. I think he had a physical education degree too. And he also taught, uh, Buddhist, uh, meditation. And he had trained with some Taoist mountain in the mass, uh, master in the mountains, uh, for, for several months had done this stint where he'd like, uh, went and did like a, what became a hermit for, with this master for several months. So he, he was just like, and to give you an idea, like, uh, he was really good too. Like he was a very good teacher. He taught me without us really being able to speak the same language, but we just somehow we managed to communicate. Um, and um, to give you an idea about like how good of a teacher he was, uh, Korea is very hierarchical, you know, like they have, they take Confucianism very serious to this day. Um, and um, especially when it comes to age. And, um, but I went hiking with my professor there and some of his students who are quite a bit older than him, like 20, 30 years older than him. And one of his students that was a lot older than him, like said to me uh, while we were hiking, he's like, I think it was the same one that translated the first time I met him, said, I've been spending my whole life looking for a good master. And this guy is it. Uh, like he has good chi is what he told me. Um, but, uh, you know, he just had uh, a lot of good things to say, say about him. And I, I learned a lot from him. Um, and he, he was in, he was somewhat for some reason impressed with me. Maybe it was me being a foreigner, but he ended up doing this thing with me where, uh, he had me doing like, I had, was doing like two or three classes a week. And then he was like, why don't you come every day? Uh, and I'm not going to charge you more. 
And then we did this thing, started doing this thing towards the end before I left where uh, I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and go to the park and train with him. And that was a little intense because he would have me do these like where I have to go around uh, this whole park uh, doing like these, these exercises where it's the, really what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to have a staff and you're supposed to do these like you know low stance these uh, 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 these steps um, and but I didn't have a staff but I had to do that and then we do these things like where we like meditate in front of a tree and stuff like that and uh, it was really fascinating and uh, I'm still in touch with him actually I just got back in touch with him via Facebook actually I hadn't talked to him for a while and then I found him on there or he found me and we still don't speak the same language, but between my kind of trying to learn Korean again, and I've started to study it again, and then him using Google Translator and knowing a little bit of English, uh, we keep in touch. Uh, but you know, he was also, him and his wife were very unique people because Korea, like I think China is in Japan too, to a certain extent. Um, you know, being a teacher there, I saw this a lot too. You kind of grow up with your life already kind of laid out before you, like. You study hard and then you want to get into one of these few universities and then once you get into those once you graduate from one of those universities like the goal is to work for one of the big corporations like um, uh, LG or um, Samsung or something like that and uh, him and his wife didn't for, didn't subscribe to that uh, they did their own thing so his life was was teaching uh, martial arts and um, and meditation and, and health practices and he has a gym now uh, and her, she was a, um, uh, a seamstress, like she had her own, uh, like, uh, what do you call that? Boutique or um, uh, atelier um, that was connected to his little school that he had at the time. So they were like, they were self-employed people who did what they loved. And that was what their families encouraged them to do too. Uh, and they were just very uh, open-minded um, uh, warm welcoming people uh, when I ended up having some problems out there with my health and also, also with my living situation like they did everything they could to help me and um, and then like we're still in touch to this day um, uh, and just really really good people very unique um, but uh, man the guy was just an amazing uh, practice martial arts and meditation practitioner and I learned a lot from him in fact um, the uh, the way I found I, I'm not going to that school now, but I'm training with some professors that I met there uh, on more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, not now with the coronavirus, but um, how I found the school that I went to or knew that I wanted to study the school that I, 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 that I was studying at here uh, was that um, he had given me some tips on what to look for from a good Tai Chi teacher. And when I went to the school there, I saw that they were doing all those things. So, you know, it, it helped me continue on uh, with, uh, with my practice. Um, so, you know, that's something I don't, it would be hard to find anywhere else, I think, than, than Asia. Even in Asia these days, you know, it's, you don't just go and find somebody who, who's had, you know, instructors from traditional masters uh, who have dedicated their lives to these arts, you know. The, uh, there's actually more interest in the West these days than there is uh, in the places that they originated. But I somehow happened to be living across the street from uh, one of the people that did have a connection to, to multiple traditional lineages. Now, Tom, now uh, the three word thing again. Uh, three words about your experience in Korea, not about Korea, but about your experience yeah. in Korea. Yeah. How you felt afterwards? Um, lots of unforgettable adventures. See? That seems like a trailer of an 80s movie. Uh, <laughs> the Goonies, but lots of... Okay, but, but it was great actually. Uh, now, you told us about Montana and then about well, Seattle, then Montana, then Mexico, uh, Puebla, right? Yeah. Uh, Korea, and all that brought you to Brazil? And uh, now... Oh, go ahead. So tell us how you got here, uh, because after all that, you're here. Yeah. Well, you know, Brazil has kind of been in the plans uh, for a long time, because like I mentioned earlier, my best friend from high school is from here. 
uh, and my first international experience was here. Um, it was kind of what actually, um, well, it was absolutely what sparked my love for travel and, and fascination with other cultures and languages was coming to Brazil when I was 17. Um, and uh, I just really loved the reception I got here, um, how open and warm the people were, and um, the food too was something I love. I'm, you know, I used to be a cook too uh, with all my many different, all the different fields I've worked in because I love food. And, um, you know, it, it was, I just had some really good, uh, a really good experience here and, and some good friends. I mean, not just my friend Alessandro, but um, uh, my friend Sabrina too. Um, she doesn't live here anymore, but who's from Sao Paulo. And then I met Alini, uh, Ryan's wife here. In fact, I was the one that introduced him to her. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we stayed in touch. And so I just, and then, like I said, you know, even when I traveled to other places, a lot of times I ended up getting along really well with Brazilians. Even when I was in Korea, I was taking Korean classes uh, at a university there at night. And uh, one of the fellow students that I ended up a lot of times hanging out with after classes was, um, an English professor from Curitiba. Um, so like kind of everywhere I go, I end up connecting the Brazilians. Uh, but uh, you know, I left Korea a little bit earlier than I wanted to. I spent a year and a half there, but I had some health problems um, that ended up kind of requiring me to come back to the US. And, uh, but I still wanted to go live somewhere else again. And kind of my plan was, was to finally go to Brazil. Um, or uh, go to New Zealand because uh, I wanted to do like a go someplace I could do a working holiday. Uh, they have these working holiday visas in uh, Commonwealth nations, the, the former colonies uh, of the UK that are still part of this, the Commonwealth organization. And I just thought it would be a fun place to go to. I've always wanted to try surfing and I like hiking and stuff like that. Um, but a week after I got back from Korea, um, to the to the U.S., I was living with Ryan in a, it was a, a trailer um, on an island off the. It's actually in the sound of uh, Seattle. We weren't living in Seattle. We we're living in this really beautiful island. Uh, and uh, Alini, uh, Ryan's wife, uh, who I'd known um, since the first time I came here when I was seventeen, we just kind of um, uh, gotten back in touch uh, on Facebook a couple months before I left for Korea. And uh, she was also, she's also a huge grunge fan, giant Pearl Jam fan. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I knew that she always wanted to come to Seattle. So I said, you know, hey, sometime when you, I'm going back, you know, when you have a vacation, you should come out to Seattle sometime and, and we can hang out. And uh, so uh, that ended up being a week after I came back from Korea. And uh, she was like, oh, can I bring a friend of mine? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Well, her friend of her, uh, fr that friend of hers um, was uh, Erica, um, who's my, now my wife. Um, so I met Erica. Uh, nothing really happened between me and Erica that first time, but we stayed in touch and then realized that we liked each other. And then uh, they came back up to see us a, couple, a few months after that, and uh, we started dating. And we did the long distance thing um, for about a year. And uh, I came out here once, um, both to see stay with her and also for my friend Alessandro, um, the, my original friend from Brazil for his, uh, his wedding. And she came out to Seattle to stay with me a couple times. Uh, I'd moved back to Seattle um, after a while because I was working there and it was uh, easier. And um, so uh, I just decided, you know, well, I'd always wanted to live in Brazil and this is where Erica uh, lives. And uh, it was easier for me to come here than for, for her to immigrate there. And uh, I was already used to living along well, far from my family, where Erica is, you know, very close to her family. Um, so it just made sense, you know, it was uh, what I already wanted to do and then I really wanted to do after I met Erica. Um, so uh, that's what happened. And then I came here and we got married. And that was, uh, well, seven years ago last month. Nice. Um, when, you, when you finally came to Brazil and, and started living here, what surprised you? What were some of the differences between what you had in your mind about Brazil as a tourist or as a outsider, as a, not someone who lived here? And then once you started living in Brazil and became a resident, a person who is here every day and has to live through the day-to-day -day experience of 
of Sao Paulo, Santo Andre, the, the culture. What are some things that surprised you? Yeah. Um, well, you know, funny enough, after living in Korea, um, what surprised me is how it didn't really feel that as different as I, as I thought it was going to, because I, I think maybe, maybe the comparison or something, but like, seriously, man, like the first year I'd walk down the street and sometimes I'd forget that I was in another country until I'd heard somebody speak Portuguese, you know, like, I don't know. It just in the comparison, I guess, it, like I didn't have culture shock at all anymore, like, uh, coming to Brazil. Uh, I mean, I kind of, you know, already had been here a couple times. Um, so like when I would have culture shock, I think was the first time, but I, even so, like it's different than living uh, in a place. But, you know, it just, it, after living in Korea, it didn't seem that much different uh, than I thought it was going to be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was actually kind of a funny thing about it. Um, and, uh, you know, how much... Uh, like pizza and Esfija Palestino was eat too. Like that was kind of a surprise. I got really fat really fast. Like I wasn't expecting uh, to gain all this weight that I did. I gained, I mean, I, I lost it recently uh, after when I had my surgery, but I'd never been so fat in my life than when I moved to Brazil. And so funny because people think about that in the US, like, you know, everybody eats fast food and hamburgers and pizza and stuff. Well, you know, Seattle has such a rich culinary um, variety there that uh, I really didn't eat much fast food when I lived there. And I also, I cook a lot at home. So like I actually ate a lot healthier than when I lived, when I lived in Seattle than when I moved to Korea. And we were living with, uh, we were sharing an apartment with Erica's two brothers and her sister. This really nice apartment in a really nice neighborhood of Sao Paulo called Ijeonopolis. They somehow found this, this giant, but yet cheap apartment in this, in this very wealthy neighborhood. But uh, because we had uh, so many people living in the same apartment and nobody really wanted to do dishes. <laughs> and at the time, uh, you know, the economy was better than it is now. What we ended up doing a lot of times was just ordering a Sfiha and pizza uh, and then eating all, all, us all eating together. Um, and so I just was like <sighs> inflated uh, <laughs> the first year that I was here. That was something I was not expecting, um, you know. Uh, so that was definitely one big difference. Um, and you know, like I said, like, uh, kind of politics and, and, and activism was a big part of me. And I was kind of surprised with how conservative actually people are here. Uh, or, um, I always had this idea where it being like, you know, a Latin open country that, uh, people would be a little bit more, um, I don't know, politically progressive, uh, than, than Sao Paulo turned out to be, you know, which is neither here nor there, but, um, that was kind was of just surprising. surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. coming from Seattle, like, you know, like I was saying, like Seattle being the way it is, you know, I always, I kind of, that was my impression of big cities too, you know, was because after coming from rural Montana, that people were generally more, uh, had more of that kind of perspective. And mm -hmm. so um, that was kind of a surprise to me too. But uh, yeah, at the same time, it wasn't as much of a shock as I thought it would be. Uh, I didn't, you know, the language, uh, I'd already studied Portuguese before I came and knowing and my plan was Spanish worked out great, except for I ended up loving Spanish, uh, when I was in Mexico and now I can barely speak it because I get so confused with Portuguese. Um, but, uh, it really, really helped to, uh, with learning Portuguese. Uh, and then I'd done, um, when, before, when I was getting ready to move here for about six months, I'd done the Pimsleur program, which I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but. Uh, it's it's a really interesting. It has this uh, this philosophy about repetitions. So, so it, like, it's all audio based. Um, so I didn't really like. Uh, I didn't study grammar. Um, I haven't I haven't studied any Portuguese formally. Um, but it hasn't gotten in the way of being a translator. Actually, I mean my translation is pretty much exclusively from Portuguese to English. Uh, but uh, I was able to teach myself for the most part. Um, I didn't really have that many problems speaking and, and understanding when I first when I first moved here, except for my parent, my my mother and father-in-law, um, just kind of because of the way they are. My um, my mother-in-law uh, speaks very fast, and uh, and then my father-in-law speaks very quietly. So it took me about a year and a half before I could speak to my mother and father-in-law and understand them. But in, in general, everybody else, um, I. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't have that much problems with. Uh, <laughs> well, I've got to say that my experience coming is sort of the same, but I did have one big surprise. Um, when I when I first came here, 
I had never been out of the United States before. So yeah. I was expecting some kind of culture shock, but it's, I didn't have any. I mean, Sao Paulo is just like another big city. And so it was like Seattle. Uh, mm -hmm. I would take public transit to work. And then because my work is an English school, I didn't have to learn Portuguese. So I would just show up to work and Rodrigo was my boss. And all of my coworkers were English teachers and they just wanted to speak English with me. And all of the students needed to speak English with me. And so I never spoke Portuguese. I still don't really speak Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And my life was basically a bubble where I would leave the apartment, go to the Metro, take the train, walk to the school, come home. And the whole time I didn't need to interact with anyone except the people that that were like, ah, oh, English, let's speak English with you. And the one surprise was that as soon as people knew that I was American, they were like, oh my God, you're amazing. Everything you say is true. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the topic is at all. I could tell them, oh yeah, actually, Albert Einstein didn't exist. And it's all just a big conspiracy theory. And this whole like E equals MC squared is not true. And um, gravity is just, it doesn't exist. And they'd be like, well, I don't know, but you're American. I'm going to look into this. <laughs> <laughs> is that true, yeah. Rodrigo? Yeah. Well, yes. It's yeah. like having a superpower. And it was yeah. like, it was very weird at first. That was the biggest cultural shock, is yeah. that I had this superpower of Americanness and that I could just tell people things and they'd be like, And here yeah, yeah. We, we, have a, we have an expression, uh, complexo de vira-lata, underdog complex or underdog disorder, something like that. Uh, or no, in, in post, imposter syndrome. Maybe. I think well, I, that'd be the best translation. I, the little yeah, I translation so. would be like, um, would be a mutt syndrome or something like that. Mutt. But I think yeah. imposter yeah. syndrome is the actual, is, yeah, what sure. it, is what it's called in the, in like yes. the yeah. Yeah, so well, here, I mean, that would be a better translation. Than just, yeah. So here in Brazil, we, we, we do that, not only to American people, but we tend to do that a lot, even to other Brazilian people. Just, ah, oh, really, I'm humble and you know better than I do. And that, well, what, what you've seen lately in media and our, and politics and everything, that's not really um, the, the bulk of Brazilian people, you know? You, you, yeah. We've seen a lot of arrogant people a lot of uh, people with erratic behavior just just crazy people and that's not uh, really uh, what Brazilian people are like people I mean the raza as you said you know our yeah. people we're, we're not like that not at all like 80 85 percent of people are not like that at all so right uh, yeah, I mean, the thing that brought me to Brazil was the people I, I, I love the people. Like, I, I feel like the whole weird a lot the complex is really a kind of crazy because for me like Brazilians are some of the best people in the world and um, it's funny because uh, growing up in the U.S. everybody was convinced that the U.S. is the greatest country in the world and then being in Brazil everybody's convinced that Brazil is the worst country in the world and neither is true you know I mean but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of funny I, I feel like it's almost like in that respect it's almost like they're like the two sides of the same coin, you know? And what were you gonna say, Ryan? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna ask you another question, but that's a really good point, yeah. is uh, that the United States and Brazil are actually very similar, like like eerily, like it freaks me out sometimes how similar the two countries are, but they're like, like looking at a black mirror kind of similar. Like, mm -hmm. like you said, the United States thinks it's the best and Brazil thinks it's the worst. Well, it's a very similar idea. They're just the opposite sides of it. And I see this a lot in Brazil. 
Is that a, something weird about the United States? Well, Brazil does the same thing, but like a little bit different. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, like, uh, it's like, like a hold my beer situation. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, the U.S. does that. Well, then we, we can do it do too, that. but in a more crazy way. Yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I have one more question with for you before we before we wrap up. I was and just uh, before I was going to comment uh, about the yeah. bubble that you said too. Uh, that's interesting because I feel like I left. I lived in a bubble too, you know, being kind of expats, and I worked at home from the time that I, I moved here, being a translator, and having my, you know, my living with my sister and her, and her, her. I mean, not my sister, with my wife and her sister and brother, and her being with her family, and then having friends here. I really don't didn't feel like I broke out of that. And then going to Tai Chi helped a little bit when I started studying Tai Chi, but I didn't really feel like I kind of broke out of that bubble until this last year when I started working with the Sao Paulo Climate Coalition and started going to a lot of different parts of town and meeting different types of people. But it was kind of like a very bubble experience. Um, now we're back in the bubble with the whole uh, quarantine thing. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that you said that because it was very much of a, a bubble at the same time. But I always, I always tried, you know, like I said, when I was in Korea and, and Mexico, like to try to get to know local people. Where here, I like, you know, I was with a family um that i married into but um somehow i still ended up in a bubble where i just uh i didn't really interact with a lot of people outside of my wife's family and, and close friends until recently you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not sure why that is maybe part of it has to do with the professional side you know just always working at home uh, but uh, that was very similar to my experience too yeah um so so my last question is if you take all of your previous experiences uh, living outside of the country, being an expat, they were all like short-term experiences that had a, a set end date. Mm -hmm. And so you knew that it was gonna end and you were able to plan your life around, oh, in six months this will be over, or the Korean situation, you knew eventually I was gonna go back home, maybe you didn't have a date, but you knew that at some mm -hmm. point you were gonna go back. But now that you live in Brazil, it's almost a permanent situation. I mean, maybe someday I, you might go back to the United States or not, but living mm -hmm. here is kind of now your permanent life. And yeah. how did your previous experiences, which, which were this short-term situation, prepare you for your current life as a permanent expat? Well, you know, um... And I think just the, the way you have to adapt to, to different situations and different cultures and different people. Um, I, I, mean, I think with every experience, I learned a little bit more of how to do that. Uh, so like the transition was, uh, was easier. You know, like I, like I said, it, it was surprisingly, um, there wasn't really much of a shock uh, moving here. I think the shocks were more about being in a, in a huge city, but even then, I mean, I lived in a suburb of, of Seoul when I was in Korea. Um, so I think it, it helped me with that kind of learning. Um, you know, one of the things being in Korea, I think I learned how to be more bold and kind of, uh, even though I can be a pretty outgoing person, I can also be kind of shy and like that just, we don't speak the language uh, and you have to go buy food and stuff that doesn't work, you know? so. Uh, it was uh, more easy for me then to come here and like, you know, all of a sudden live with this other family, you know, that like I was, you know, of course, I'd already spent a lot of time with Erica, but I, I didn't know her family. And it, it wasn't that bad because I ended up getting along really well with everybody, her parents, brothers, uh, sister, uh, everyone. But, you know, just kind of having to adapt to other people's ways. And, uh, and even though, like you said, it's, it wasn't that different from the U.S. Still, like there's quite a few things that you just have to and be in a different situation, a different work situation, a different city, uh, different activities. Um, I think being more adaptable, being more bold, um, and uh, you know, uh, learning those things, you know, adaptability, and also getting, getting over the social anxiety shyness that I had before, um, that helped a lot um, in making Sao Paulo 
in, in the Sao Paulo area, my home. Um, so yeah, I think the, it, it was much easier for me um, than it would have been otherwise having had those experiences beforehand. And, um, you know, also just, I think I have a, generally I am able to kind of, I've always been pretty good at this, but I think even better now, um, transitioning between different social groups, you know, hanging out with people of different backgrounds, different social classes and stuff like that, different interests. Um, I think it's generally a little bit easier for me because I kind of know when to shut up and listen and like when to talk when I'm with a new group of people. And, uh, uh, that was something that I think I learned uh, kind of the hard way in Mexico because I was kind of I did a little bit of a snot-nosed arrogant kid when I went there and then got to be pretty humble uh, after six months there and then uh, in Korea where you know you just uh, you had to really just kind of feel your way through things because uh, at the same time that it was one of the Asian countries it's most influenced by the West it's also just has such a totally different background very different cultural perspective and uh, that was what I loved about it, actually, because like I said, it was always an adventure, but uh, you really have to learn to kind of, you know, feel your way through things, understand that people do things differently and that, uh, you know, kind of figure out how you fit in uh, with that. And so I think um, that helped me move into another city, another place, integrating into a new family, a uh, new career, too, because... Um, I had done a lot of different things before I became a translator and uh, I actually just started translating when I came here. Um, and uh, I ended up landing a really good job that helped me learn a lot and transition into that. So a lot of it had, was, I think had to do with luck too. But you know, uh, yeah, when it comes down to it, I think learning that kind of uh, adaptability, uh, how and when to be, to be kind of outgoing and bold with people and, um, you know, and then also kind of being able to also, on the other hand, um, uh, be quiet and kind of feel your way through things and, and know how to integrate. Uh, I think those are things I learned from the previous experiences. Cool. Um, well, I think that's it. Unless, Rodrigo, do you have anything else you want to ask? Anything else for today? No, no, no. I have some. I have uh, other ideas that I'd like to talk to Tom, but I did it will take uh, forever because they're very complex. It involves uh, Taoism and spirituality and then homeschooling, lots yeah. of things. Maybe we can have another meeting. We'll have to have another another episode with Tom. Sure. Uh, so thanks, Tom, for coming on. It's really My great. My pleasure. Um, and you covered a lot of stuff. So um, just thank you a lot. Yeah. And everybody that's watching, don't forget that Tom is a translator. He just mentioned it, but remember that he's a really great translator. So if you have anything that you need translated, whether it's a, a document or some presentation or even a complete book, um, look for his information in the description, which is right below here in the video, and, and send him an email. Contact him. My website's down at the ma at the moment, but it should be right back up pretty soon. So if you guys try to look for my website right away, it may not be there, but it'll be back soon. But I'll give my email to um, and uh, you know other contact information. So, which is better anyways? I mean, it's just to get contact with me directly. Cool. Maybe maybe if you have a TikTok or a Snapchat account, uh, maybe people can check you out there. Oh yeah. Uh, I've got there's a there's an animation made on Snapchat right now circulating of me being an Easter bunny that uh, apparently is quite hilarious. So maybe I should put that as my professional information. There you go. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> but for for everybody, thank you for watching and check out all of our other videos. Last week we had a really great one about the present continuous, and next week um, I think we'll be doing one about adjectives. And check us out, of course, next week for whoever our next guest is. Guest yeah. is. And until then, see you guys and have a great week. <laughs>